session of AIJC 2020. Some quick housekeeping notes before we start. You see on your screen Roy Blumenthal, who is our resident sketch noter and caricaturist. You'll see him at work, and from time to time you'll see a close-up of his work, and we will share it at the end of the session. For your questions, please use the Q&A function, and the facilitator will pick them up and pass them on. We need to keep to a strict time frame, so speakers, please stick to your time allocations. Have a great session. Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining this workshop on strategies for financial survival, uh, jointly organized by the Global Investigative Journalism Network and the African Invest Investigative Journalism Conference. I want to extend a warm welcome to our colleagues at the AIJC who have joined us today. My name is Benon Oloka and I'm the Africa editor of the Global Investigative Journalism Network. And I'll be moderating this session along with my colleague, Caroline Japo. In this session, we also have uh, the AIJC's resident illustrator, Roy Blum Blumenthal. He'll be drawing some nice caricatures of us uh, while the session is ongoing and those will be shared at the end of the session. Caroline. Hi, hello again and welcome everyone. It's great to be with you here today. I'm the development director at the Global Investigative Journalism Network, and I've really been looking forward to this session with all these great folks. It's timely. As we all know, funding journalism and especially investigative journalism is difficult at the best of times, and the COVID-19 pandemic has put journalism organizations under even greater pressure. This workshop will fo focus on practical revenue strategies for surviving the 2020 pandemic and for sustainable journalism in the long term. There are many ways to pay the bills and indeed diversification of sources of income is really essential. But today we'll focus on two sources of revenue, fundraising and audience engagement. Experts will share practical advice about first, how to improve fundraising skills at this very difficult time during a global pandemic. And second, why an audience centered approach can serve both your journalism and your bottom line and tips for developing a strategy for educating, ed engaging audiences. Then we'll hear from journalists and media managers from South Africa, Kenya, and Senegal, who will share their experiences and tips on financial sustainability. We'll try to stay focused on investigative journalism in particular. We'll try to leave as much time as possible for discussion and questions, and please send written questions and messages in the Q&A box, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. So let me introduce our speakers today. Um, first on fundraising, um, we have Bridget Gallagher, who is a veteran fundraiser and the founder of the Gallagher Group. She provides fundraising strategy, implementation assistance, and counsel to US and international clients working in, in the media. She also provides information access and civic participation assistance her clients include Internews, PBS, and GIJN. Uh, next, we have Paula Frey, who is the founder and CEO of Frey Intermedia, uh, based in South Africa. She has worked as a journalist, editor, trainer, and media manager. Her organization, which was founded in 2005, works to improve the quality of journalism in Africa and to strengthen fundraising skills. Now I'll move to, the two, to our speakers on audience research, development, and engagement, uh, where we have Ben Whitelaw, who is a content strategist based in Sierra Leone. He previously worked for The Times, The Guardian, 
and the European Journalism, Journalism Center. His areas of ex expertise include online news, community engagement, brand building, web production, and social media. After Ben, we'll make a transition to what we are calling our reports from the ground. And in these reports, we'll hear from media organizations uh, based in Africa, starting with uh, Philly Sharalombos, who is the CEO and publisher of South Africa's Daily Maverick. He has uh, helped establish and develop various media startups and projects, including, of course, the Daily Maverick, and then The Gathering, which is South Africa's premier media and politics conference. He'll pick up from Ben on the importance of audience engagement and then share some tips and strategies uh, much more generally. We'll also hear from Churchill Otieno, who's the head of development learning at the Nation Media Group in Kenya and plays a critical role in the execution of the group's digital expansion strategy. He's a pioneer in online journalism in Kenya with more than 15 years of experience in digital media. Otieno specializes in newsroom leadership and digital transformation. And from Senegal, Hamadou Tidian Sai is the founder of the award-winning Quest Staff News and specializes in journalism training and consultancy throughout Africa. He's also considered a pioneer of online journalism in Senegal and is the founder of AGCOM, a journalism and digital media school in Dakar. So let's get started. Fundraising first. Bridget, welcome. Thank you, thank you. Uh, good morning and greetings from New York City. It's really delightful to be with all of you today. I'm really sad not to have the chance to make another trip to Joburg, um, but thanks everyone for joining us today. So we're going to talk about everybody's favorite topic, uh, fundraising. So I'm just gonna share a few slides here. Um, and talk a little bit about how the pandemic has changed the way we think about some of these. Um, my contention and the way I try to help my clients think about fundraising is fundraising or habits. Um, I think a lot of journalists who come to this practice, you know, tend to think of, you know, they, they get involved, they start a journalism organization, they pursue news because they care about news. They care about, you know, producing editorial work that makes a difference. Um, and maybe fundraising isn't something that they've spent a lot of time doing, or maybe it's your least favorite part of your job. Um, but it's the most essential function of your job, right? It's as essential as the editorial work that you produce because without money, you know, none of those freedom of information requests, none of those fact-finding trips, uh, none of those special, you know, tools or equipment or software happen to make your stories more robust and help you connect with your audience. So fundraising is an absolutely essential skill. And I think it's, it's a practice. It's a habit. It's the, you know, the really successful organizations that I work with. Um, it is something that you do every day. It's the first thing you think about when you wake up. It's the last thing you think about before you go to bed at night. Um, and so I think the key to really um, developing and building an effective fundraising strategy is first and foremost, you know, kind of embedding that as a practice, as a habit, um, and thinking about, you know, what's the, as a, I think as an entrepreneur, it can be very hard to prioritize this, but I think one way to think about it is, you know, what's the one thing I can do today to move my major gift strategy forward? What's the one place I can make a difference today? I think one of the things that also makes people feel anxious about fundraising is one, in general, people are reluctant to talk about money. Conversations about money and finances tend to make people anxious. But the other thing that I find makes my clients nervous um, or kind of uh, anxious about fundraising is it feels like a game that you're playing without knowing the rules. Um, so let's, let's talk about some of the rules, right? Fundraising is about relationships first and foremost, like any other business transaction you will do, like any other relationship you will develop as a journalist, right? With a source, with a colleague, with a friend. Um, this is about relating to people. Um, it's about how you treat people, how you think about people. Um, so the first thing to remember is, you know, donors are people, people give to people they know, and people give because they're asked. Um, if you think about it, you know, we're at the very beginning of journalism being something that we think about supporting with philanthropic dollars. Um, this is not in a deeply entrenched tradition in many parts of the world in the same way that we think about philanthropy in terms of, um, you know, food banks or education or 
public health, right? Journalism is sort of a new philanthropic enterprise. So don't assume that people even know you're a nonprofit, much less what you need in terms of charitable contributions. It's up to you to ask, to ask for uh, what you need to help people understand what a meaningful gift is. And sort of the golden rules of fundraising are if you ask, you might get, right? At the end of the day, you know, it's, it's up to the donor whether they'll decide to give or not. But if you don't ask, you definitely won't get, right? I often refer to the, you know, hockey star Wayne Gretzky said, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. If you don't make that ask, you're not getting that gift. They don't just fall from the sky. So these are the things to think about in terms of the rules that sort of govern these conversations that we have with donors. Um, and the number one thing I would encourage you to keep in mind as you're thinking about how to approach a donor is, it's about them, right? It is about how the donor benefits from a relationship of your organization. Um, I think that piece that kind of hangs people up when they're talking about a fundraising relationship is the sense that you know if there's there's weakness or you're losing power in asking somebody for a charitable gift and that's not at all what governs these relationships what you want to be thinking about is you know this is this is a business proposition again like like anything else that you might do in starting and building your journalism business this is about defining for somebody else what they get out of a partnership with your organization. So a donor, you know, a, a donor's return on investment is going to be different than somebody who's making an equity investment in your organization or who's placing an ad or who's taking out a subscription. Um, but they still need to get something out of this relationship, whether it's a tax deduction, whether it's a sense of how this advances the rest of their charitable goals. So defining how that donor benefits and being able to tell that story to them in your conversations with prospective donors is the key part of this argument that you're going to need to get right and put some thought into. And so that's where these habits come in. I think that the first habit of a successful major gifts enterprise is preparation. And I think as journalists, you're, you're, you know, this should be the easy step for you, right? This is desk research, basically. This is um, backgrounding somebody, getting to understand a foundation or a philanthropist and what he or she wants their philanthropy to achieve. Uh, what are their goals? And how can you then use that knowledge to define an argument that speaks to those goals? Um, you know, here, here in the States, we're really lucky um, to have this very kind of transparent sort of philanthro industrial complex, right, where it's pretty easy to understand what, a, what an organization or a philanthropist interests are. Uh, you know, you can hop on Google and do a pretty accurate search of somebody's giving history. We have some specialized databases um, at the, you know, with the Foundation Center here in the US. Resources for African philanthropy are not quite as robust at this stage, um, but there are some interesting resources out there and they are getting better. Um, Trust Africa tends to document some of the trends among African philanthropists and foundations. Um, there's, there's the African Philanthropy Forum, which actually has a conference, I think, coming up next month, uh, which actually convenes um, both Africa-based philanthropists and philanthropists from around the world who invest in Africa to kind of share strategies, compare notes. Um, one of the easy free resources that I think is a great starting point for anybody trying to understand philanthropy in your corner of the world is the Media Impact Funders Media Grants Database. Um, you can search by location and kind of see, you know, who else is fundraising in your region and who else is supporting organizations in your region. So desk research is sort of your first and most basic step to sort of understanding what is it a donor is going to need to hear um, in order to pay attention to your work. Um, the other point I would make about this is desk research will get you 50% down the road, um, but you're going to need to supplement that, you know, because there's often a big difference between what a foundation, for example, might say about itself and what it actually does when you're looking through their 990s or the organization that they support. Um, and you need to look at kind of what they say about themselves versus what they do. And you also need to think about your own network, your own sources, you know, think about the, you know, the way you would understand a subject you are profiling in an editorial context. Think about using your own network and resources in that same way to get that sort of intelligence from people who, you know, who actually know that philanthropist that you're trying to get in front of. Um, <laughs> Pardon me, just a couple of points about the kind of African philanthrop philanthropic landscape. It's one of the fastest growing in the world. Again, not quite as transparent as what we enjoy here in the US, but the number of foundations giving to Africa have grown significantly in the last few years. So it's, um, it's an encouraging place to be doing this work right now. The other point I would make is that giving is still primarily personal, right? People, if you look at 
the causes that people are giving to in terms of health, in terms of education and why they give. I want to make a difference is the number one um, reason for giving cited in the Africans Give Back report that UBS put out a couple of years ago. That people give because it means something to them. So how do you describe your work in a way that makes it clear what it means to that donor? <clears throat> so the second habit is presentation. This is where the rubber really meets the road and because this is where you actually initiate that conversation with this prospective donor. So I think it's always a missed opportunity if you walk in the door or hop on that Zoom or that phone call with that donor and spend the entire meeting talking about yourself. What you really wanna do is think about this as a conversation, right? This is, again, this is a relationship. This is like a friendship or a business partnership. You want to give this person the chance to get to know you and you want to get to know them so that you can tailor that argument as to why this should matter to them. Um, <clears throat> so in the first place, if you're lucky enough to connect with somebody in person or have that introductory conversation, um, spend more of your time listening than talking. In the best of all possible world, you know, we do have that opportunity to introduce ourselves in person or kind of virtually in person. That's certainly not always the case, especially in COVID. So your presentation might not be this kind of in-person dialogue, but it might be a two-page organizational overview or a five-slide deck. And in that case, you want to think about how you can make your argument in the most kind of crisp and succinct and compelling way that speaks to that donor's interests. I tend to think this of this as kind of breaking down answers to three key questions, right? Why this? Why now? Why you? Why should this donor be paying attention to this problem now? Um, you know, why are you the best person to solve it? What makes this really unique in the community? What's the inflection point that you're responding to? And again, that most important question, how does the donor benefit, right? What's in it for the donor? How does this help them? And then the, the final step, and I think the most important and kind of the hardest to get right, because it really, this is really the one that you have to do every day is persistence. Philanthropists are really busy people. Um, it is, you know, there's a ton of competition, particularly in COVID, you know, where we're dealing with a humanitarian crisis, a public health crisis. Um, you're, you're competing with a lot. There's a lot on people's plates right now. So don't take it personally if somebody doesn't get back to you right away. Uh, if there's, you know, a six week kind of drop off where they sort of ghost you after that first conversation, uh, stay in touch, you know, mark it in your calendar. I tend to think that you wanna be in somebody's inbox every four to six weeks to kind of remind them after you've had that introductory conversation you know we we talked we connected here's what here's what was important here's what stood out from our meeting here are the things that i promised you i'd follow up on or the introduction i promised i would make you know if you can make yourself helpful to that person and if you can demonstrate that you're trustworthy you're reliable you do what you say you're going to do those are all things that i think help advance that relationship um, and just kind of share that sort of uh, share those stories, you know, what's what's working well in your organization, what are you proud of, what's a story that rolled out that made a difference, use those sorts of developments as excuses to stay in somebody's inbox. Um, so, and make a plan for tracking that data, you know, again, I find it really easy and most straightforward to just kind of like put a pin in my calendar when I'm due to follow up with a prospect, um, but there are all sorts of tools you can use from a simple spreadsheet to, you know, a CRM like Salesforce to kind of track that sort of news management and help you stay on top of that um, in an environment where I imagine you're juggling a lot of other tasks. Um, these we don't need to talk through. I did just want to flag for you some, some resources and some kind of food for thought in terms of how you might pivot and adapt to the sort of pandemic situation um, where, you know, I think the thing to remember, it's, it's easy to feel sort of pessimistic about how much competition there is for philanthropy, but typically in moments of crisis, donors really do step up and give more. Um, so know that, you know, while yes, the competition is stiff, people are also generous. Um, at the same time, what I would encourage you to keep in mind is, for that same reason, you know, people are also busy. And so, you know, we as fundraisers need to apply that sort of generosity to the people we're talking to as well. You know, we need to give them time. We need to give them space. We need to appreciate that everyone is dealing with a lot right now and is really tired. Uh, so think about that, you know, weave that sort of strand into all your conversations and think about what opportunities this creates for you to really make that case for, you know, what has COVID taught you about the way your work needs to be done or what the community needs from your organization um, and make sure that you're really hitting those points hard in your, in your case for support and in the communications that you're making to donors. Bridget, thank you so much. Um, thank Paula? you. 
Thank you very much, Caroline and Benin. I'm really, really honored to be part of this um, 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 panel. I, I, I believe that sustainable journalism really is an issue about um, press freedom, that we really, um, um, that in order to have press freedom in our country, we really need to be able to fund our journalism. So I wanted to compliment um, um, what Bridget um, um, has just done. And so I'm going to be focused primarily on, on what we do as individuals when we're trying to support our, um, our investigations and find funding for our investigations. Investigations. Um, so let's get going on that. Um, so, so, so really, um, when we're looking at um, investigative journalism and, and, and sustaining our investigative journalism, one of the things that I really want to stress is that support for our investigative journalism is much, much more than simply getting money. Um, money obviously is important and we need to be able to fund our, our work, but all, it's also about finding different resources. So resources to be able to do the stories about building networks, about finding funding or support for coaching, for example, or even finding collaborating, um, collaborative efforts, efforts for our investigative journalism. So when we think about sustaining investigative journalist, journalism, if you're an investigative journalist, think beyond the money, think beyond and simply um, applying for funding, but think about building these kinds of networks. And I mean, just a really quick tip, right? I mean, sign up for newsletters, um, sign up for, for GIJN's um, newsletter, sign up for, if you're in Southern Africa, for Jam Labs newsletter, um, um, sign up for the International Women's Media Foundation, um, um, sign up um, for China in Africa. All of these organizations really do look at supporting, in-depth reporting on the continent. It's also about not seeing um, um, applications um, um, to fund your investigative journalism as being something that happens when you see a call. It really needs to be a sustained process, something that you're constantly keeping an eye out for opportunities. And even when you're doing an investigation, to be applying for funding that can support the next investigation or even your follow up. So firstly, support is much more than simply getting funding. It, it really is about resource mobilization. The next thing I wanted to stress that if you're looking for funding for investigative journalism, it doesn't necessarily come wrapped up in something that says, um, here's an application for funding for investigative journalism. Think of finding funding for your storytelling in different spaces. So look for calls um, 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 and for democracy building um, proposals, for storytelling proposals. Look for calls that are specific around gender issues, um, you know, about around the, the, the sustainable development goals, for example. Look for calls for community building. Um, I mean, one of the, I, I know that many journalists that I've worked with often work with NGOs um, um, who are doing advocacy programs that it's Itself has some issues and so I would say that if you're doing something like that you know look at the potential ethical issues of working very closely with an organization and if you feel confident that you can actually keep a little bit of distance and 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 the independence of your investigation then certainly looking at NGOs who are doing advocacy programs is a nice way of looking for um, investigative journalism funding then. And I want to just kind of speak about when you're doing the proposal and and, and getting your individual proposal to stand out. Um, I think we as journalists are really fortunate because there's just so many life skills that journalism and good journalism actually teaches you. And so for me, good proposals are like good stories, right? Um, they're targeted at the audience. They know exactly who's reading it and what the, the interest of the reader is. They're well researched. They're not a thumb suck. Um, you've done some research before you've punted a story um, to a donor um, or even a theme to a donor. It's written logically. Um, you're taking the reader on a journey, on a logical kind of journey. You're not jumping from place to place, but you're actually building up a picture for the reader to come to the conclusion that they absolutely want to fund you. It's clearly presented, subheadings where necessary, right? Um, all of the work nicely stacked in, in clearly defined blocks. And of course, good writing is deadline driven. It meets the deadlines. Um, so why am I stressing that? You know, because the reality is, is that I think we need to understand that people aren't sitting there waiting for our proposals. Our proposal literally is sometimes is, is one of hundreds, sometimes it's even one of thousands against submissions. And when you're doing a proposal, you need to recognize that the initial kind of sorting process is really to check 
whether the proposal meets the most basic submission requirements. You know, so don't think that your story is special and therefore you're going to write a proposal that just ignores what the funder is calling for or what the criteria is for, for the um, um, submission. Really make sure that you meet the submission requirements. Um, and as much as possible, also recognize that, that more than one person is making this decision. And so you can never assume that the panel actually understands your context, understands why this is important, understands why they need to be funding you. And I want to stress, both as someone who has made submissions and gotten and asked for feedback on why they weren't successful, as well as someone who actually sometimes does proposal reviews, is that very, very first cutoff is whether you submitted all your documents, whether it meets the criteria, whether you filled in the forms properly. So you really want to be thinking about the basics even before you think about how to make it even better or special. Um, the next thing that really that stands out about journalism um, and, and, and journalistic applications is that sometimes we apply for a same old, same old um, um, story. Instead of really kind of thinking that I'm applying for a, a unique story and investigation that really needs funding in order to happen. And so I need to show that I've done my basic homework. Don't apply for funding in order to do your homework. Um, you want, when you're applying for funding, you want to show that you've already given some thought um, um, to the story that you want to do. You want to give, um, 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 you want to show the person um, who's going to be giving the money that actually this is a doable story. I, I think that donors understand that sometimes you can invest a lot into a story only to discover that actually um, it, it, it's not really a story or, or you misunderstood something, but you do need to do your homework and you do need to show that you've actually taken some precautions to show that the story um, um, does have a plan. Um, so I, really, I, I want to, I'm, I have prepared a much longer presentation um, as a handout and I'm keeping it short just because there's just so many of us with so many good things to be talking about. Get the basics right in your application. You know, paint a very clear picture of the problem that you're addressing. It speaks back to what Bridget is talking about. You know, why this story? Why this investigation? Why now and why you? Don't also um, um, make an application for a story that is time bound and that needs to be done before the deadline um, um, of the application. I've actually seen that, right? Where people will apply for a story that actually needs to be done tomorrow um, and, and the proposal is only being reviewed a month later. So really think about the timing of the call for the proposals as well as how long it's going to take you to do the investigation. And then never ever assume that the reader, in this case, the donor or the funder, actually has an intimate understanding of the issue or of your context. Always tell the donor what you think they need to know. Um, as Bridget said, I want to reinforce, um, align your proposal idea to what the donor wants to fund, but also to the donor's budget. If you, um, you know, if, if the donor is offering funding of up to $20,000, don't come with a $22,000 um, proposal unless you're making it clear in the proposal that you're covering the excess um, of 2,000. And sometimes donors do want to see that you're making an investment into, in, into the proposal that you're making. Also be aware of storytelling restrictions. If the donor wants to see the final product in a month or in two months, and your um, investigation is going to be taking a year, then break your investigation up into stories that can be published over the period and ask for funding within the donor's timeframe. Also check are there language requirements. If the donor wants the application in English, right? Don't submit it in Kiswahili um, or in French. It's submitted in the language that the donor has requested as much as possible. So I want to actually, I've got two minutes left and I want to talk about some common mistakes I've seen. It's not a cut and paste. Please don't go have a, 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 a funding proposal and then simply find and replace in your funding proposal. It's a really good idea though, to be focused in the kinds of stories that you want to tell and to know these are the things that I'm going to ask for funding for and, and, and not simply follow the money and ask for applications um, all over the show. But at the same time, don't have a shotgun approach. Don't send the same application 
to the um, um, to different um, um, calls, make sure that you're actually um, um, ensuring that it meets the requirement of the specific um, um, funder. Be thoughtful about your story idea um, and, and don't be too long, but equally don't be too short. If you're too short, you really can't make a persuasive argument about why. Other common mistakes is that the, the story you're proposing doesn't show impact um, or you've done no research on it. Um, and, and so you can't actually argue why the story is so important and why it needs to be funded. Um, we can have lots more discussions, but I think I want to go back to the very, very first slide. A good proposal is like a good story. Know who you're talking to, know what they need, know what questions they're going to ask, and then target your proposal to that person. And for heaven's sake, do a spell check before you send it. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Paula, that you're, you're, you're speaking my language here. Uh, we have time for one question to Bridget or Paula. And we have an empty box. Any questions? Move quickly. Okay, it looks like uh, given the time frame, perhaps we should move on to, oh, we have one right now. Okay, one question. Uh, in almost all countries in Africa, the donor community is much more of a club where everyone knows each and every one within that community. Half the time we often find the club hard to break in unless someone knows someone. What would either of you like to take perhaps Paula because you're on the ground there, um, but Bridget feel free as well. So, I mean, it's true that sometimes um, 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 some funding comes because you know somebody and somebody lets you know that there is in fact a, um, a proposal or call for proposals, et cetera. But I want to reiterate what Bridget was saying actually. Now, when you're thinking about fundraising and, and you're looking for funding for your media entity, it actually is a lot of work. You need to build a relationship with potential funders before you even send out a proposal. So it's exactly what Bridget was saying, yes. right? Have a better understanding of who's funding what, um, you know, in, in, in your area of coverage and then begin to build relationships. So Francis in some ways is right, right? It's about people, about knowing people, but you need to make an active um, effort to actually go out there and understand who's funding in your country, what are they funding, um, how are they funding it, and then to begin to build relationships so that when there is a call for proposal, they at least are familiar with your work. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think even, you know, part of that relationship building just to, to, you know, spot on, like, I agree with everything that Paula said, but, you know, it's like, sometimes if you are really diligent about your relationship building, you can actually inform those RFP processes, right? It's like somebody says like, oh, you know, I see a huge issue, you know, there's this whole, you know, sphere of reporting that needs to be done on gender in my country. Um, and, you know, through conversations with funders, through building those relationships, it's like, well, this is going to be a priority for that call for proposals now. Like you actually do, I mean, I think if you are really diligent about this in the best of all possible circumstances, you can actually help inform that philanthropic agenda. Um, it's not even so much about like fitting yourself into it on the back end. Excellent, thank you so much, Bannon. Can you take us to the next section? Yes, I will. Um, you can hear me now. Yes, we can. Hello. Bannon. Yes, can hear okay, you? sure. Now, um, let's move on from money matters to audience matters and how important it is to build audiences. Um, as you know, at one end of this spectrum, you know, there are subscriptions and the issues of paywalls. Uh, but the, before that, there are also steps uh, which uh, are supposed to help a media organization to understand its audience. Uh, it's critical to understand the customer before asking how him to start paying for the product. Uh, that's why we need to tackle this. Otherwise, if you don't, why would you measure, analyze or engage with your readers and viewers? Uh, and also without diverse sources of revenue and the reader or customer base, the prospects for a longer term success are much uh, more limited. So let's start uh, from the beginning. If one is new to these approaches, the first question they'll be asking is, where does one start? Uh, ben Whitelaw will help us uh, respond to that question. Thanks so much, Ben, I really appreciate that. 
um, and thanks for inviting me, everyone. Uh, I hope you can see my screen. Um, so yes, as Ben mentioned, there is a, a, a tricky question that we have to ask about why should people care for the journalism we produce? Uh, and in my 10 minutes, I have some very colorful slides and uh, hopefully some insights about audience development and why it matters. Um, it's crucial to the sustainability of any journalism organization to know who your audience is and what they care about. And in this 10 minutes, I'm gonna give you a few tips uh, and talk a little bit more about my experience uh, in this. So before we start, I just want to tackle the question of terminology. And you may have heard of some of these terms or come across journalists who do audience engagement, community development, uh, audience development. Um, and whilst we don't have a lot of time to discuss this today, um, there are some slight differences, but broadly speaking, these are all part of the same discipline and the same function that is emerging within newsrooms uh, across the world, really. Um, and they form kind of what I call part of the, the work of making sure that your journalism matters to your audience. You know, that is what we're trying to do here when we talk about audience development. And I don't want anybody who is new to the topic to become stuck or, or hung up on these different terms. So here we're really simply talking about how do we make sure our, our work matters to our audience. Um, and it's worth briefly reflecting on, on why that is um, and how we got here. And I think it's worth just saying that the internet has completely changed our relationship with um, what Jay Rosen called the people formerly known as the audience. And audience development has only really come about in the last uh, you know, 15 or 20 years as the internet has opened up journalism to an unlimited number of people. Um, whereas before our audiences were um, localized, they were perhaps very specific, relatively niche. Um, the internet has completely changed that. Uh, the distribution, the content production, and we have a real challenge now to work out who our audience is in the age of the internet. And, and that's where audience development is a skill and, and a discipline, as I said. So how do we know that it works is a question you might be thinking. Um, well, there's increasingly a body of research that is showing that uh, journalism where the audience is involved in the process of doing journalism, um, all the way from listening to them to actively partaking in journalism can, can do a lot for an organization. Um, it can increase trust in the journalists and the organization itself. It can increase the willingness of people to financially support the organization, as we've heard already in this session. And also it can lead to greater civic engagement. Um, and this is a, a report produced by Lindsay Green Barber, who looked at five US media organizations who employ various types of audience development and found lots of benefits in, in thinking about the audience differently, uh, listening to them and involving them in the process of journalism. So we have this definition of journalism, um, uh, of, the, of audience development and, and journalism that cares about its audience. But what does that mean in practice? I want to go through a few things here, um, kind of how I like to think about it in terms of the jobs that a newsroom is doing and the skills that we have to have as an organization to be able to, to go and do this. Now, the first thing that um, an audience development person or a, a team or somebody who's responsible for audience development will do is, is identifying the audience. Um, you know, what is it that uh, they, who are the audience that we want to go after? What are their characteristics? What are their, you know, what is their demographics? And also what challenges do they have? Um, what things do they struggle with or what things are they looking for? I think that's something that to, to really start off with. Don't pretend like you, you have what that audience needs. Um, and, and that's a very good place to start. Then it's a case of finding those audiences. Those people are probably out there already, whether they're close to you um, geographically or in terms of interest, they are elsewhere in other communities or, or elsewhere online. And it's a case of finding where they are. You know, are, are those organizations um, somebody you can partner with? Or, you know, are they, are they also getting things from that organization that you can, you can also do as well? So think about whether those people exist already, because it's not likely that they are new. Then it's a case of acquiring those people. You know, how do you get them to have a relationship with you as a starting point? 
how do you make them a social media follower or a newsletter subscriber or an occasional visitor to your website? Uh, and again, think about you know, what it is they're looking for, what messaging might resonate with them in terms of um, your, your kind of mission or your goals, what kinds of stories would they like, what, what kinds of things that they, they need in their daily lives that you, you, you can provide. Uh, and again, what channels are they using? So lots of questions here for an audience development team to, to think about. And then finally, retaining those people once they're aware of you, once they come to you. Um, how, how do you get them to come back more often? Uh, what is it that will make them habitual and loyal? Uh, this is one of the most toughest parts of, of uh, an audience development kind of person's job. And it's really difficult, as you'll know, to, uh, to build up a loyal audience. But that is the foundation of creating a relationship that um, Paul and Bridget have talked about already. Um, and then in terms of those skills, you know, lots of journalists have uh, editorial skills that may not have audience development skills. And I just want to briefly run through some of those. The first thing that is worth um, thinking about is, is data and data literacy. If you're, if you're trying to find out, you know, uh, the demographics of an audience or what people um, coming to your site are like, then having an idea of, of data and data analytics is really crucial and something that all journalists have off the bat. Um, understanding content is clearly key. Um, obviously, editors and journalists generally have a good handle of this, but understanding why people come to you and your organization for your journalism is a, a different prospect. You know, what, how is it you can match what you're producing to those audiences that you've identified? Understanding distribution channels is also something very important. Um, you know, how can you best tailor these tools that we have at our disposal, social media, newsletters, webinars, these kind of um, activities? How can we best get them to work for us? Is something that's really, really important. Uh, and understanding the nuances of, of the algorithms and, and the products that we have at our disposal is crucial. And then finally, having a kind of product thinking mindset is also very important, <clears throat> excuse me, how, how are we able to fit the user needs of that audience to our outlet and to our journalism? How is it that we're solving some of those challenges? So you can see here that the jobs that a journalism outlet thinking about audience development should be doing and the skills that you should be hiring for um, if you're looking to bring somebody in doing this. Now I want to give you a few quick examples um, of organizations doing this elsewhere that I've come across on my travels. Uh, and I wanted to start off with Medor which is a, a Belgium investigative outlet. Um, they produce a quarterly print publication and have recently just launched um, a membership, um, a digital membership as well. They're a cooperative, so they have um, almost a thousand shareholders and they have almost 2,600 of those subscribers that I mentioned. And so they're beginning to monetize their relationship that I talked about earlier. Um, what they did and what you can see in the photo is they did a very simple thing um, after they discovered that the investigations that they were producing weren't reaching their intended audience. Um, they would do pieces about um, male candidates in cities or the state of schools in, in towns um, around Belgium, but they realized that people weren't reading it. So what they did was they created these distinctive yellow posters, which told locals about stories that they had published in their magazine and online about that town or city. And they were using that as a mechanism to try and draw people into being aware of Medor and, and to read the investigation. A very simple um, audience development trick, actually. Um, and, and these were not only displayed at places around the town in question, but they were, they were sent to newsstands, cultural centers, local shops, and they, they acted as a way of reaching out into that community and to establish relationships between Medor and some of the businesses as well in the city. Um, and that process actually led to an expanded investigative series called Medor on Tour, where the whole uh, investigative team went to different places around Belgium for a week at a time and, and designed an investigation with the community from scratch in, in the place um, itself. So their experience of, of, of developing their audience with these posters actually led to a whole new initiative um, uh, that was a, a kind of in-depth investigative process. Um, which um, involved meeting readers face to face and them shaping the investigation that they, they wanted to produce, which is very interesting. Um, another in investigation um, on the African continent is Ray Dabanga, which some of you may know. Now they're an independent 
news outlet. Um, they they uh, primarily focus on human rights abuses and gender-based violence, but they cover a lot of news in a country which has, you know, as you know, very little press freedom and a lot of challenges. Now, they focus a lot on um, radio, radio and shortwave radio to allow them to cover the country and increasingly on TV. But what I really like is the fact that they use um, WhatsApp and, and calls to action to help um, them based in, where they are based in Amsterdam, um, seeing as they're not allowed to, to, base, to work in country, they use this network of informants and community listeners to shape their coverage and to send them stories and pictures and, and nuggets from towns and cities across Sudan. And they have over a hundred WhatsApp groups that they man um, 24 hours a day they have between one and 2,000 WhatsApp messages and pictures that they get sent. And that allows them to reflect what's really going on in the country and in their coverage. Uh, they obviously fact check this information before it goes live, but they feel very connected to the, the population as a result of having these channels and, and listening in this way. Um, and so that's something that I would definitely recommend taking another look at. So in the last few minutes, I just want to really give a couple of very practical tips and next steps um, as to how you, if this is kind of piqued your interest and you're interested in finding out more and what you can do to better understand your own audience. And the first thing is to, to, to say is to, that there is a lot of resources out there and a lot of experience, a lot of guides that um, your organization can take advantage of. A lot of the questions that you might have probably have been answered elsewhere before and I'd urge you not to try and reinvent the wheel or think too deeply about it. You know, go out there and, and, and look at some of these resources. Um, you know, I used to work yeah. at the Engage, Engage Journalism Accelerator um, and a number of these other programs do a lot of great work as to how you can better connect with your audience to drive sustainability. Uh, ben, oh. um, yeah. I request that you summarize uh, those uh, you know, the final points such that we can uh, move on in the interest of time. Sure. Uh, running out, yeah. Sure, Benham. Um, Thank you. Yeah, just to say to appoint, uh, appointing somebody in your organization is key. I don't think this is something that um, you should just let slide. I think having a dedicated person is crucial. And then as you get more advanced, there are lots of things you can do. Um, audience, developing audience personas, so types of reader or listener that you can think about as you're creating journalism is, is a great way um, to help reinvent your, your relationship with your audience. So um, I'm very happy to share other, other uh, links and resources, but, uh, and also to answer any questions. Okay, thank you, Ben. Um, your, the last point that you made on audience retention and engagement uh, now allow us to segue quite smoothly to Stilly, who will expound on that and also help put uh, in context, some of the wider challenges, as well as speak about uh, some of the really good work that they're doing in this area. Steely? Thank you, uh, Benin and uh, Ben. Um, yeah, I, uh, I've got a provocatively named presentation today, the four most important words uh, in news media. Um, uh, but before I get to that, just a little bit about uh, myself, um, the co-founder and CEO of Daily Maverick. We founded the organization back in 2009 in a couple of days time, will be 11 years old. Um, we started uh, that process back then. It was a, a small team of five editorial staff and a part-time CEO myself. Um, but things have grown a little bit since then. We are now a team of 80 people. Uh, we were digital only until a month ago when we launched a print newspaper. Um, we have 3.7 million unique visitors per month to the website, 200,000 newsletter subscribers and 15,000 active members. So we've experienced quite a bit of growth, quite a bit of uh, uh, upward trends and the, the size of our newsroom has doubled in the last two years. And I think a lot of that has to do uh, with the four words that have changed our lives and continue to do so. Um, it's four words, but two concepts, uh, and those are data-driven audience centricity. Um, and so if I could break that down into a little bit more detail, the data-driven part really talks about uh, listening, uh, collecting data, asking, analyzing, interpreting, interrogating. Um, and the audience centricity part is about how we use that information. What do we do with all that data that we've collected in a way that addresses the needs of the audience, that solves a job that needs to 
that needs doing and that creates value for our readers and our audiences. Uh, because if we create value, then we can find a way to monetize that and to support the work that we do either directly uh, through the audience themselves in the form of a reader revenue program or membership program uh, or through grant funding or even advertising. So uh, it's important that these two concepts go together. If I had to choose a North Star for media going forward to help with not only sustainability, but other greater concepts of being a news media organization, I would choose data-driven audience centricity as that concept, as those concepts that guide us forward and keep us on the right path. So how exactly did that change our lives? I'm gonna share with you a couple of examples uh, of how we did that and how we, uh, um, we use data and we engage with our audiences to create uh, products. And the first one is um, ahead of the, our membership program that we launched, uh, we ran a minimum viable product, which was a recurring donation program. Um, and at the, uh, at the end of that uh, couple of months of uh, this recurring donation program running uh, as the precursor to our membership program, we asked those people who had contributed, uh, and this was really only just a financial contribution, nothing more. Uh, we asked people, how often did you visit, how often do you visit Daily Maverick on a regular basis? And we could see from the information that 80% of the people who contributed financially were daily visitors to our site. So that gave us a clue about who we needed to be targeting, but also um, it also helped us understand that we should be monitoring the kind of content and the kind of stories that the people who visit us daily are consuming, because that's going to give us a clue as to where we should be dedicating effort and uh, editorial resources going forward. Something else that we asked them was um, ahead of the, the launch of the membership program was which benefits do you value most from this list that we've created as a short list that we were preparing to, uh, to roll out and that we were considering to roll out. And what we could see is um, from this voting process that, that happened, um, we could see that the opportunity to engage with Daily Maverick journalists and readers and, anal uh, and analysts was right at the top, uh, was a clear winner. Ad-free browsing uh, on the website was close second, uh, a members only newsletter with insights uh, behind the scenes about the organization um, and, the mem and members only ability to comment on articles and access to members only events. So this really gave us uh, insight into what our um, most loyal and uh, dedicated readers and those who are willing to contribute financially to us, what they valued in a membership program. And it helped us weed out some of the, the other suggestions that we had. And so um, as we were about to launch and we were getting ready to, uh, to list the benefits on the site and to throw some resources behind, we changed one or two and, and moved them ahead in the rollout process based on this information that we got back from donors. Um, we also asked them to, to rate which content influenced their decision to donate. And unsurprisingly, uh, our investigative exposés were right at the top, 50% uh, of the survey respondents chose that. And next thing was our newsletters, and then behind were our feature articles. Now, um, as I said earlier, knowing this, knowing the kind of content that uh, these uh, people who are willing to contribute financially consume, what do they value? Uh, when the opportunity arose for us to increase the size of our newsroom, to increase the resources and the, and the size of our uh, editorial team, we knew that um, we could put more effort behind our investigative team. We hired more investigators. We went from six newsletters to 13 in the space of two years. Um, and we put the resources that matched uh, that matched what we were seeing, not only because this is what they wanted, but in, you know, in a resource constrained environment where you'd love to do a lot more of everything else, it helps to get this as an extra data point into your decision making process. So um, what were the results of this? Um, as, I, as I mentioned, it helped us know who to target, where to go find them. Uh, we know that uh, people who come to the site daily often use the homepage or come via our newsletters. And so we, we, would, uh, we targeted our early membership marketing to those places. 
and um, and as I also mentioned, we knew what products to invest in. So uh, bringing in more investigators and growing our newsletter suite uh, quite aggressively in the last years. Another example that I'd like to uh, bring to your attention is something more recent uh, that we've been doing. And so the membership program has been growing uh, pretty well over the last years, um, 15,000 active members in just over two years, which is a phenomenal, uh, has been a phenomenal experience for us and has also been a life-changing experience for us to have that kind of support, not only the financial support, but be able to have this highly engaged community that we can access um, for all sorts of things, for input, for surveys, for feedback, for voting on, uh, on certain things, um, for uh, volunteering and all sorts of other, um, uh, other great op non-financial opportunities for them to become engaged and involved with us. Um, but something we've done recently on, on the, on the data-driven uh, on the data-driven side of things. Uh, a couple months ago, uh, after hard lockdowns, this is an extract from uh, our daily analytics report that looks at the last 30 days. So this report is for the 30, trailing 30-day 30 period uh, up until the 25th of May. So uh, a little over two months into hard lockdown uh, in South Africa, um, our uh, unique visitor numbers to the website were sitting at about 3.8 million. Um, and we could see that um, uh, 3.8 million was our total unique visitors. And we measured this segment as uh, 15 plus sessions. So the number of people that uh, visit the site and have more than 15 sessions in a month. And that number is important to us at 55,000 there because that kind of gives us uh, a guide as to the potential, a rough guide, if you will, as to the potential number of members that we can attain given enough time and enough effort uh, on that path. And so sitting at 15,000, we know that we could grow to 55,000. And that was a number that we monitor quite closely as the potential. And so we know that there's still a lot more room to grow. We don't have to worry about if we hit a little bit of a plateau. Uh, but the trick is how do we keep increasing that number, uh, that 55,000, um, even though uh, as good a number as it is, the trick is how do we keep going with that? And so uh, we've been working on a data project that's been monitoring uh, some uh, articles. For example, this is one, um, uh, one small report on a big data project that we're working on. It monitors the articles that uh, are doing well that aren't listed on the home page. We know that people who contribute financially to our site like to come through the home page. And so these articles that uh, were listed and alerted to us as being uh, good performing articles, not on the home page, we could then go and add them back onto the home page to give them an extra bump and an extra opportunity to be seen by people who may have missed it out on the first time that it was published, given that we publish 50 plus articles on a daily basis, uh, articles don't always get uh, the longest period of time on the home page. And so what's happened now is that if we look at the same report uh, and now from the 25th of October, we can see that our new, uh, unique users to the website is still at 3.7 uh, million. But what we've been able to do is we've been able to grow that to 121,000 using data-driven uh, techniques. And we can see that uh, in the other report that we saw previously that those two articles that I mentioned made the list uh, or the top performing articles that were read by people with more than six sessions. So just another practical example of how data-driven audience-centric techniques can help develop and drive audience growth. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Steli. Um, I will ask just one question uh, before we move on. Um, with the benefit of, you know, you started out in, a, in an entirely different uh, context to what we have now, uh, with the benefit of your uh, experience, but also the kind of thing we are dealing with right now, what would you point out to somebody who is starting out as the, the you know, one, the top tools that they should be looking out for, and two, the top approaches or the, the things that they should keep in mind as they're trying out to walk down the road that you have walked so far? Uh, ben, and you, you broke up with some of that question, but I think I got the gist of it in, you know, for a small newsroom that's starting out now, what, what should they be doing? What should they be focusing on? And I think, you know, uh, Ben mentioned this earlier that there are uh, a lot more resources out there now than uh, when we started, even though uh, th there was still uh, some there for us. And I would say lean on the work that a lot of other people have done. 
people uh, told us that uh, Africans wouldn't pay for or pay to be part of a relationship with a news organization. And I think we've proved that wrong. Um, and even though we started out in a very small place, it's just start, test, uh, experiment, experiment with a framework, experiment with a, with a, uh, uh, with a proper uh, procedure in place and learn from that and iterate uh, onto the next uh, onto the next experiment until you find something that you can throw as many resources behind as you can. Okay, thank you, Steely. Um, I'll now pass it on to Caroline, who will uh, take us on from here. Excellent, and thank you, Steely. That was wonderful. There are really some real challenges on the ground in terms of attracting revenue and it's only been made worse by the COVID pandemic. So let's now hear from two other organizations about their own particular experiences. I'd like to welcome Churchill Otieno from the Nation Media Group in Kenya. Welcome Churchill. Thank you, thank you very much and uh, happy <coughs> to be here this uh, evening to share with you uh, from Nairobi. Uh, interesting insights there, especially from uh, Ben, and uh, the, the, our friend from Daily Maverick, I think they speak to a lot of the uh, issues that we've uh, seen come to us in very, very real terms uh, here uh, at Nation in Nairobi. <clears throat> um, at the end of last year, the Nation Media Group got into a partnership with the Hivos uh, uh, NGO out of uh, Netherlands. And uh, what we sought out to do is to create this platform that could monitor and track uh, public contracting. Uh, put simply, how does uh, governments, you know, uh, get goods and services, and who are the people who benefit from these uh, goods and services? So we went uh, went out training our teams and um, uh, ended up deciding to build a platform to do that kind of work. Then, as we all know, uh, COVID happened, and since January, the whole world has been uh, looking at nothing but COVID. Uh, initially started out of China, crossed into uh, Europe, into the US. We thought it would come to Africa, eventually it got to Africa. <clears throat> uh, th this did um, affect our project a little bit, uh, but it also then offered us a major opportunity. If you look at uh, uh, the Kenyan uh, curve as it were, I'll just share one slide to, to show that. Uh, if you look at the Kenyan slide as it were, Kenyan, uh, Cover as it were, uh, we find that uh, at week uh, uh, week 21, the curve surprisingly begins to uh, to get flattened. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> and the reason for that is a story that we did out of that portal known as COVID Millionaires, that essentially tracked uh, how uh, uh, you know. Uh, tenders around the supplies and the fight against COVID were being shared by different entities uh, uh, connected to government. Uh, these involved us tracking companies, finding who those com direct directors of those companies were, and then coming back to use tools to then uh, 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 see whether those directors are connected. I mean, you, these tools were able to show us whether they are shared um, uh, shared physical addresses, shared offices, and things like those. Uh, our focus initially was to look at the national kind of space. Uh, but eventually we found that uh, companies active far from the city uh, drew a lot more interest from most of the uh, our audiences. And that's so as shifting focus from national to those county areas. The, the effect of that story was the, the curve uh, flattening after week uh, 21. Uh, and basically what then happened is that uh, the government started doing less and less tests. Um, two, two key insights uh, came out of that. One, that the curve was being held up artificially to sustain mostly uh, illegal procurement as it were. Uh, but the, the reason I'm sharing this story is that um, we would have known that uh, the interest, uh, the more interest uh, around us was in the uh, uh, <coughs> rural areas, was away from the city, if we are not looking at uh, the analytics, uh, if we are not con uh, tracking uh, audience feedback. And uh, 
key to us uh, was five major uh, major takeaways. One uh, is that it's critical that as we move to fix media and as we move to fix uh, investigative journalism, it is very, very critical for us to then fix, uh, uh, to then know our audience. And I think Ben has shared some metrics that we could use to then uh, uh, do that. Uh, the second one is that it needs to innovate small, but constantly. You know, uh, use small teams, uh, a small scale, uh, to, to, to get uh, experiments going, uh, but only when they're confirmed, uh, uh, do get to scale up. That helps with two main things. One, uh, from experience, it helps keep the costs low for you, even as you confirm traction with the, with the relevant audience. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> then number three, and I think this is probably more critical for us in investigative journalism, is that you have to stay on mission. And the mission of journalism is uh, to hold power to account, you know, accountability reporting. Uh, it's, it's more important today because a lot more people are able to publish. Many of the people traditionally covered as sources are able to directly share the messages with audiences. So that begs the question, what then is the role of a journalist? So I think uh, uh, investigative journalism increasingly is becoming the only journalism that we can do and investing in it then is important. Number four, um, we found fairly quickly that uh, the editors and the journalists have to think a lot more about the money. Where will the money to do the journalism come from? You know, traditionally, us being a traditional media house, we started in newspapers 60 years ago, went into broadcasting uh, about 30 years ago. Uh, we, 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 for a very long time, held on the adage that uh, we have to keep a Chinese wall. You know, so the bean counters and the money people were sitting on one side and as good people who don't really think about journalism. But this project also showed us that uh, journalism will not happen unless journalists know where the money to drive that journalism comes from. So the stories that we do, uh, the audiences that we choose to connect with and how that um, uh, whole money process is managed uh, must be a concern for us editors. Then number five, uh, uh, and the last one, uh, well, last key lesson for us, uh, that I think was also forced on us by COVID is that many times investigative journalism requires fairly specialized and uh, oftentimes expensive talent uh, to get going. And sometimes uh, that, that, that expertise is not uh, available to us in the markets where we are. Uh, but there's a new concept that has come up and I think it's been forced and uh, 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 popular, popularized by uh, the lockdown measures brought about by COVID, and that's the concept of a distributed newsroom. That uh, it doesn't matter where that expertise is in the world. Uh, if, if you really need it, you can find it. And it's possible to, to have it available for you in a newsroom without uh, the expensive travel and sometimes without the expensive transfer in, uh, <clears throat> in, uh, in talent. And, uh, and, and that's something we continue to use. Some of the expertise we used for this project that we called and must are people based in Asia, but they've been very, very helpful in helping us uh, then create uh, that portal. Yeah. So uh, a key takeaway for us uh, in terms of driving investigative journalism for going forward is that uh, we've been working to protect journalism by trying to protect media. Yet uh, uh, the, the main lesson is that we just need to fix journalism and make that journalism oriented to the audience. Um, uh, sometimes we do interesting stories uh, using sophisticated tools and make them uh, uh, fairly, uh, you know, out of this world. But a lot of time, those formats just stick to us in the newsroom. They just stick to us, the journalists who are doing those stories. Using tools to track uh, audience engagement will enable us to see which of these stories then has much as interest with the audiences there and why. Uh, and which ones are they engaging with and why? And then creating a feedback loop uh, with that audience will always help uh, uh, continue that process on an ongoing basis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Churchill. Uh, now, Hamadou Tidian C from Quest F News in Senegal. Thank you both. Thank you, Caroline. I hope you, you, you can hear me. I usually put down my, um, my um, video off because of the, the, the internet connection. I hope it works. 
Uh, actually, I'm, I'm very new to this, all this conversation about money and about sustainability. Although I've been in journalism for all, all these years, and, and I come here with more questions and challenges than answers. So probably the, 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 the conversation will, will help. And um, I would come, maybe I start with Bridget's remarks at the beginning. Journalists usually tend to focus on news and forget about the money. And actually it's been my case at West Staff ever since it was created back in 2006. Uh, it was more about content, about doing journalism, about an editorial project, but not about a business. So we, we, we had no business plan. I had no um, business model. It was just, okay, I want to do investigative journalism. I want to do good quality journalism. I created my website. I think we were at the beginning of the digital um, era, uh, the online journalism era. And it was easy to have a website. It made the costs uh, much cheaper, for instance, if I were to uh, create a newspaper or a radio station, it would have cost much more. So yeah, I think the, the online platforms made it easy and cheaper to create uh, platforms where a good journalist could share his passion for good journalism. And when I started West Half, uh, I don't know if I have too much time to, to go through it. But when I, was, when I started it, I was still working as a journalist for media outlets. So it was my spare time plus my spare money that I was investing into West Staff. So, uh, and it actually went like this until 2012, when I started thinking a little bit, yeah, it's too much for one person to uh, try and be the, the promoters of funder and the everything, the one paying the salaries. I used to work, get the money, and reinvest in my own platform. So 2012, I called other friends who were working in other media houses, told them, you can come and join me. So what I'm doing, we can maybe double it or triple it. Um, by doing what, you would uh, spend some of your spare time uh, helping increase the, 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 the production, the content. Um, we tried it, it did not really work. But still, I was not in the yet, let's let me go and find money. Because for me, independent journalism meant, uh, yeah, no influence, no control from those who have money. So until 2014, 2014, I think was the very first time uh, the website had had many recognitions and awards and this and that, uh, but we never thought money. I was not thinking money. I was just thinking, yeah, it can, it can continue. 2014 was the first time a, uh, a foundation, Osiwa, some of you might know it, the, the, the George Soros Foundation approached us. It was during Ebola and telling us, you're doing good work. Would you be able to do something uh, on Ebola with other? And we, we, we had this project with eight news outlets and we started getting funding from uh, Osiwa. And it's how we started getting um, this relationship with, 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 the, with, with the philanthropists, if I can put it that way, foundations supporting uh, media houses. And um, I think it's very recently, maybe two, three years ago, that we really started thinking, because as, it, as you can see from my gray hair, I may not be here all the time. And I started realizing I may not be here all the time. So if I want West Africa to survive, we need a business model. We need a business plan. We need to start thinking money. And we're in this transition process where we, we, we are working on a business model. We are working on a business plan. And the approach is uh, to now uh, create a, a vast uh, shareholding, shareholding base, to have a lot of shareholders to work with audiences, to work with all these things that we've heard. It's, it's interesting that I hear that people are trying to get uh, funding from the, the, their audiences. 
Uh, these are the things, these are very new to, to us at West Africa, and these are things we're trying to work on. But for us, for me, regardless of will this work, won't it work, we, we should not forget that journalism is also about, it's about content. And for us, what has allowed us so far to exist and to have these organization like Osiwa and those who, come, who came afterwards, who started supporting us, actually it's the credibility of our content that helped us get in touch with. So I think having the credibility, the, the reliable information, those who are supporting us, now we have a few, now we, we recently had IMS, the Danish organization, supporting us for something on COVID. Uh, before that, we had the European Journalism Center through a program they had in Senegal supporting us on a media and excellence, uh, media, excellence in media program. So, but all this was based on our credibility, the credibility of our platforms, the credibility of, of the content. So the, the idea for me is, Yes, it's good to think audience. It's good to think of all these strategies, business plans, business models, but it's always critical, at least if somebody wants to have a support, be it from big organizations or from individuals that we, we realize that content is key. It's the content you're giving to your audience. It's the content that your potential partners are looking at that will uh, inform their decision. Do we support them? Do we, do we go with them? So I think it's good that we, 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 we have that in, in mind. Sustainability does not only mean, okay, let's focus on the money, let's focus, uh, let's forget about the journalism. We will have always to, uh, to, to deal with content, to deal with journalism. Yes, the big challenge is how do you translate the awards, the credibility, the content into money. I think that's really one of the big questions. I've got some of, uh, some answers here uh, while I was listening to, to some of the of the presentations. And something interesting, uh, and for the past year or so, maybe a little bit more, I've been part of a program with Deutsche Welle where the, the whole thing was about media viability. And during those conversations, it was a one-year program that they called Digital Media Pioneers, where they brought together people from different parts of the world uh, discussing, sharing experiences. And what I have learned through that process is we need to diversify and it's where we're going up with, with, with West Ham. Um, the, the journalism we used to do where it would be only content and content-based might change. And uh, when talking about di diversifying, it means the journalists might find ways to make money not only through journalism, but through other ways. We, we, we've seen that person in Germany who from one investigation would create a, 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 would create a piece of, 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 of theater, I believe, or a movie, a documentary that he will show into uh, public halls, into public places to generate, to generate income. Uh, there are several other different ideas that, that we have explored. And, the, the key words there would be diversifying the, the revenue streams. I think I can stop there unless people and allow people to have uh, questions um, and say thank you for, for having me in, in this conversation. Sure, fantastic. Um, I think that um, what might be helpful given this particular distinctive thing is that I wanted to invite um, Paula and Steely and others to sort of reflect a little bit on what Hamadou has said and see if you can offer any particular kind of reflections. Paula, do you have any thoughts for Hamadou? I mean, you know, the one thing that really just stands out from what Hamadou is saying is just how important it is to actually have a business plan that, you know, that, that, that it doesn't just happen, that it needs to be a really kind of intentional process of putting together a business plan and then working towards that plan. But perhaps still he could speak a bit more about that. Yeah, I think um, if I look back at one of the factors that really contributed to our ability to sustain ourselves over these 11 years has been the fact that um, uh, the partnership that I have with uh, our editor-in-chief and founder, Branko Brickett, um, and the fact that I, you know, I was able to get involved with editorial strategy decisions and he was able to get involved in business strategy decisions and that, that marriage and that partnership 
uh, where we were able to, to rely on each other's skills and inputs in helping uh, to do that so that we weren't these siloed uh, compartments that never engage and that and, and I think that really helped us get through um, get through the tough times uh, of which there were many but the fact that we were both really in tune with each other and that we were both able to be well versed in each other's uh, in each other's um, uh, specialities. Sorry, Caroline, I, um, I also wanted to say, I think one of the things that really is useful for media startups particularly is to be quite entrepreneurial in your approach. And mm -hmm. so, yes, it's important to have this long-term plan, but also that flexibility to be able to see something or to see trends emerging or to see specific needs for your audience, like Silly was saying earlier on, and then to be able to find a way to meet those needs and where possible to also monetize. Great. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, I have a couple of questions here. Um, I'd like to take have questions specifically first for Churchill and Hamadou to address that and then to the larger group in the remaining time that we have. Um, Churchill, a question for you. Um, audience members want to know uh, why you're opting for a paywall and how you think it will perform in an environment where others are creating, calling for greater engagement with audiences. And would you rather oh. every media organization opts for a paywall or can a paywall op ex coexist with other strategies? Um, we are going for a mixed model, you know, um, where we'll have parts of our content available on the paywall, but a lot of our journalism will continue to be available uh, freely to a larger chunk of the African audience as it were, because now we've gone and uh, uh, our, our focus is more on Africa as opposed to Kenya as it was before. Uh, as for the second question, how it will perform, uh, the short answer is that we don't know, because uh, it's an unusual um, uh, thing in, uh, in our market, uh, but we are very, very keen to learn. You know, We are very, very keen to find out what is it that people would be willing to pay for, and uh, how, or how, what would it take to put that uh, product together on a consistent basis. So lots of uh, cultural change in the newsroom to reorient us to a learning mode uh, and an experimentation mode. And it, it helps that uh, one of the people helping us uh, with that work is Ben Whitelaw. I happen now to share our uh, panel with him today. Yeah, uh, but it's a huge, it's a huge shift in um, in a mode where we used to think that uh, the editor knows it all, and uh, what we gave out is what there was, and uh, the audience had to live with what we have. To to um, to a situation where being we are, we are basically teaching ourselves to listen and to understand what is it that uh, people are asking for. <clears throat> Sometimes they don't ask for it directly. It takes using lots of data and crunching lots of numbers to just draw the insights. But it also takes, uh, uh, you know, uh, reorienting the mindset in the newsroom so that people are a lot more open-minded to know that sometimes they don't know, you know, and that they should listen in and see what, what then would work. We also are very clear that uh, uh, for, the last, for the most time, we've been very big on political stories but sometimes the political stories are not what the payroll will ask for. So we've, uh, uh, we are going through a phase where we are, we are really emphasizing on all editors to open their eyes to see uh, which is this gem that might then uh, get us going. Uh, but it's clear, it's very, very urgent for us because the advertising revenue is shrinking and shrinking very, very yet uh, as a business, but also uh, as a key player in the democratic space in the markets where we are, uh, the, the voice and purpose that we serve must continue to be served. Thank you. Great, excellent. Uh, I think Ben, you had a question for us, a question from the panel. Yeah, thanks Caroline. Um, for those um, three leaders that we've, we've heard from, um, Amadou, Stilly and Churchill, um, I'm interested in what you have had to devolve to your teams or um, admit that maybe you don't know in this process of, of learning that you've all talked about um, and, and how has that been, you know, has that been difficult at all? Uh, 
the one thing um, <clears throat> that is clear for us is that uh, uh, the, the regimented nature of the newsroom has to change. You know, it, it's always been that the editor knows it all and sort of defines direction and not just direction, also defines story formats. You know, I want this kind of story, this kind of shape, and this kind of time. Uh, but increasingly, we're finding that we have to let the person in the situation uh, to, to lead in that conversation. So, so a lot of power is moving to the reporter, is moving to the supervising editor, the person who connects directly with that reporter. But even that supervising editor, we are saying that uh, they, they have to take feedback and only use that feedback to then uh, help guide how they, how they lead and uh, guide their teams. So, so you've created what we're calling a service desk uh, where a lot of these editors sit around. Uh, and the, the one um, ingredient that they are consuming every single day is, is, is feedback. It's feedback in terms of metrics, feedback in terms of direct communication from, uh, from users. Um, and, and every single day they're asking themselves questions and, and they're working with their teams to see if they can respond to those questions. And then given whatever response they give a question, they then go back and track and see, uh, uh, now that we covered this story differently, did it work? Did it bring the engagements that we are looking for? Uh, those kind of things. Yes. Excellent. I think we have time for one more question. Is there anything one wants to put in the Q&A box? Caroline, maybe I can um, uh, respond to, to Ben's question while we wait for, for the next one. Is that oh, okay? sure. And we've got one here, but yes, do make it do do uh, jump in. Yeah, um, Ben, I think if I if if I had to think about and list all the things that I don't know, uh, my head would explode and it wouldn't be enough uh, pages <laughs> on the Internet for me to list everything. So um, the, the best that we can do in, in in response to that situation is to is to rely on two things. Number one is a clear vision of what it is we'd like to achieve and, and um, the mission that we have. And you know, if we're clear about that, where we want to go, what we want to do, what we want the outcomes to be uh, and sort of big philosophical uh, type of answers, then that's a great starting point. And then the second thing is, is a framework uh, for us to be able to um, deliver new products, to think of uh, new ways of, of, of approaching uh, business opportunities and, and problems and challenges and editorial opportunities and challenges. And if we've got those two things, which is a vision uh, for the organization, a vision for the business, a vision for the editorial team and frameworks that allow us to work towards that, then the uncertainty that, that, around, that, that exists around everything that we don't know, because it's just impossible in a resource constrained uh, organization like ours and industry like ours, uh, to be able to, to do that, then we can learn in that process in an efficient way that doesn't uh, break the bank, that doesn't, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, cause the organization to go under uh, and that uh, we can do that in, in a way that doesn't hurt us, but we can learn as we go. Great, good. Uh, we have a question for Hamadou here. Um, have you explored seeking funding from African-led NGOs as against Western organizations? Is the question for me? The, the question is for Hamadou. Have you explored seeking funding from African-led NGOs as against Western organizations? For me, um, as I said, at the very beginning, the idea was, yeah, let us try and do things by ourselves. That was the philosophy. And of course, right now, we are trying to, to open up more. Uh, I think in 2015, 17, 16, I can't remember exactly the date, we had this process where we had the chance, because I'm something called Ashoka Fellow. So Ashoka uh, helped me to get some uh, experts who tried to uh, put us through a process after which they told us all you need to, um, to have is foundations or NGOs that share the same values and you can try and partner with them or seek funding from them. So from that point, things started shifting. It's, and it's really when we started looking at uh, other organizations, like currently we have uh, the Danish organization, IMS, International Media Support, um, supporting one of our projects 
uh, investigating um, the, the, the COVID issues in, in three countries in the, in the Sahel. Does it answer the question? Aaron? Uh, yes, it does. Um, it, it's fine. Yeah, that's, that's okay. Now I have one last um, question before we, can, we conclude. Uh, that is the question of uh, in, whether anyone on the panel, this will go, I think, to Paula and Steely uh, mostly, and perhaps Churchill, uh, is anyone earning enough uh, from crowdfunding in Africa to fully run a media organization? Philip Paula? Uh, ben and I can only speak to, to our experience. And so we generate about a third of our revenue uh, from mm -hmm. our uh, readers. Um, so which is quite a significant, uh, a significant number for us. It's allowed us to double this. That's after we doubled the size of our newsroom in the last two years as well. So um, I'd like to think that we're a, we're a strong candidate uh, for that. It doesn't fully cover everything. But uh, we have a diversified revenue plan and revenue mix. Uh, we don't uh, want it to be the, the major and only source of income. It's part of a, a, a diverse strategy for us. Okay, and I, thank and you. I would actually, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, sorry, I would ahead. support what Stilly is saying that really when it comes to funding, I mean, you need to be looking at a multiplicity of, of incomes to um, sources and not, not on one thing only. Okay, thank you. Now, um, we've run out of time, so we'll be concluding at this point. Uh, but before we end, I uh, would like to inform the audience that if you want to take the opportunity of having a one-on-one -on -one meeting uh, online, of course, at the moment, with either Bridget on fundraising or Ben on audience engagement, uh, please email AIJSC. Uh, and the email address is AIJSC at journalism.co.za. I'll just repeat that, AIJC at journalism.co.za. Uh, and once you've emailed them, uh, we'll help to arrange uh, for that meeting. Um, you'll also see the email on the slide. Thank uh, you. Yes. So tomorrow, uh, the AIJC continues, uh, uh, the conference continues. Uh, you join us for two sessions. The first one will be on how we uncovered widespread sexual abuse allegations against Ebola, Ebola aid workers. Uh, the journalists who did this investigation uh, will be making a presentation, so please join them. Uh, the second session is on the world's best, best data stories and a case study of cracking open uh, the SA lottery. So that will be another session for tomorrow. Please uh, join that session as well. Uh, finally, I would like to thank my co-moderator, Caroline, as well as the AIJC, of course. And I want to thank you too, uh, to everyone in the audience today. Last but not, uh, by, but by no means least, a very, very, very big thank you to our six speakers. Uh, this was uh, quite um, an intense session, long session, but they managed to summarize a lot of the issues that you, you know, they had to discuss with us. So big thank you to Bridget, Paula, Ben, Steely, Churchill, and Hamadou. Thank you, everyone. And once again, thank you to you all, and goodbye.